We're going to open with two scripture readings, one from the 18th Psalm and the other from the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, if you'd like to be opening your Bibles to those places. As you can see on the screen today, we're going to take a look at the perfection of God. And one of the interesting points about the perfection of God is this. He is the only thing in the world that is. The weather is not perfect. Sports, not perfect. Politics, business, hobbies, families, you and me. There's nothing in the world that we've ever seen that is perfect except God. The psalmist writes about that, 18th Psalm, starting in verse 28. For you will light my lamp, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect, the word of the Lord is proven, he is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places and teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now, to Moses' writing, first four verses in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock of his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. These Bible writers are making a spectacular observation that God is perfect. We can't say that about anything else we know. There are times when we might go to work doing something that we're completely qualified to do and experienced to do, and when we get through with the job, guess what? It's absolutely right. But is it perfect? Could you nitpick and find some little nitpick thing about it that isn't perfect? Likely we can't. These Bible writers then go on to explain why and how God is perfect. And today we're going to examine the attributes of God's perfection. Our motive for making this examination is that God wants us to know that because he's perfect, he therefore is worthy of our time, devotion, service, worship, and the suffering we might have to endure as a result of our conversion to New Testament Christianity. The more we understand how perfect God and his way are, the more faith we'll have in committing to his commands because they make our way perfect. 2 Samuel 22, verse 33, God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. This is the connection that we're looking at today. God's way is perfect, undoubtedly. And when we do God's things, God's way, our ways become perfect. That's what David said in that writing in 2 Samuel 22. God makes my way perfect. In what way does God make man's ways perfect? There are four ways in which God manifests his perfection. 
four ways that his superiority might be seen and made known to his people. And those four ways are on the screen. He is perfect in word or truth. In love, his righteousness and holiness is perfect. His faithfulness is perfect. That will be an interesting point. We'll get to that next week. The more I worked on this lesson, the bigger it got. And I ran outside my 14 and a half minute time frame. So I had to cut it up. We're going to look at the first two points today and the second two points next week. But I'd like to give you this little temptation. Have you ever studied the faithfulness of God? Because usually when we study faith, we're talking about our faith. In him. So this is a new twist, but it's not new. We're going to look at the faithfulness of God. In the 18th Psalm, David said, God's way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. In Deuteronomy 32, Moses said, Is he not your father who brought you and made you and established you? His love is perfect. Also in the Deuteronomy reading, his work is perfect, his ways are justice, righteous, and upright. His faithfulness is purchased, perfect, and so we go to Hebrews chapter 6 and we begin, begin to look at the perfection of God more closely. And in verses 17 through 20, we find something that is so important for us to understand. If you're ever studying with lost souls, this is not a bad place to start. To try to get people to understand this first about God, about the Word, about His truth. Hebrews chapter 6, 17, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promises, the immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hope, lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. And we'll stop with one more verse where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. If I may be brief in the examination of these verses, it's important for us to understand that we can have this great hope. The Bible writer called it steadfast. The Bible writer said we have strong consolation. The Bible writer says this hope we have is an anchor for the soul because it's impossible for God to lie. He's perfect. He can't tell a lie. He's perfect. So now well, let's take that and let's go study the plan of salvation. What did God say about faith and baptism and repentance and confession, etc.? You know why you can believe that, young Bible student? Because God can't lie. And what did he say in these verses? You can believe it. And that's the anchor for your hope. When you think about God's perfection on this point, it's so easy for man to lie. Have you ever been lied to? Have you ever told a lie? We live in a world full of lies. You watch any advertising on TV? Have you ever bought anything off the television set and got it home and said, what a pack of lies? That stuff's not nearly as good as they said it was on TV. I mean, when I look at this stuff on television, it's just perfect. It's everything you need. It doesn't matter whether it's a pharmaceutical or it's a new hairdo or whatever it is. The people in advertising get paid to lie. They always stretch the truth. 
It's never as good as they tell you it is. Our society is full of fabrications. I wonder if we have a county judge in this county who's ever heard lies in a professional capacity. Not me, I'm not the one. I'm not guilty. So here's God in this world and he's not capable of doing what we're capable of. He cannot lie. That's how great he is. And that's how perfect he is. Let's turn to the book of 2 Peter in chapter 1. 19 through 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prof prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and because the word came from God, and it's not subject to any private interpretation. What can we deduce from the word? It can't be wrong. There can't be a lie in it. Because it's God's word. There couldn't be any lies in it. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 13 verse 8 on the screen. For we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. Here's the point that that scripture is making, and there might be more than one. God's word is so true, it can't be bent or compromised so that man can be accommodated. We can't believe what we believe is the truth just because we believe it. I, I, I got the scriptures and I believe it. Why do you think it's the truth? I believe it. I have that kind of emotional attachment to whatever the preacher is saying. The truth is not made true simply because someone believes it. Psalm 119 verse 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. It's the only thing we know for a fact in our lives that we can hear day by day and we know when we hear it, that's the truth. Because God can't lie. I want to turn to the New Testament book of Titus <laughs> and the first chapter. And we'll read the first three verses. Paul writes, as a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior, and I must stop there. I want you to notice the connection here between these two words or phrases. One, just like the Hebrew letter, God cannot lie. Two, his promises are connected to that. And the point being, you can believe in eternal life because God told us about it and he can't lie. In these days, there were people whose faith was being stretched and taxed because there were so many naysayers who wanted to contradict what Paul was preaching. Oh, the resurrection is past. Oh, they've got all kinds of things about Jesus Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection of him. And they want to talk about the second coming. It's already happened. There were so much... So many false teachers in the world during Titus's reign as there are today. And so this is the introductory comment that Paul makes to the young preacher. 
that God cannot lie, and the hope of eternal life given us was promised by God before time began. If Christians long for eternal life, and we should, with this knowledge in our hearts, God cannot lie, then we can believe and endure the trials of this life. I believe in heaven. Why? That's what the Bible teaches. Keep preaching. God cannot lie. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor is he a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make good? This is a gospel sermon by itself. All of the things that God has said about grace and mercy and forgiveness and the cross, those things can be believed by the child of God because God is not a man and he cannot lie. And therefore our comfort and our hope and our faith should be in this fact. God can't lie, what does he say? How people get out here in religion and change things without any authority Going against the scripture, I guess they must have left out Hebrews chapter, I mean Hebrews chapter 6. Why are you changing things? Because what you're getting out of the Bible is perfect. God can't lie. God spoke more than 300 prophecies in the Bible. And the only prophecy remaining unfulfilled is the second coming. In Genesis 33, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And God did exactly what he said he would do, even though it took hundreds of years for it to materialize. And we live in the day of the second coming now, and it's been a long time since we got that prophecy. But we know if God said it, he's going to keep his promise because God can't lie. Final point on the word, on truth, in Hebrews chapter 3. We'll read the last couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 3. Start reading in verse 17. Now with whom was God angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Was it not with those who wouldn't keep the perfect commands of the God who can't lie? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? One more verse. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This is how the word saves us when we know it's perfect and we keep it. That's how we're made perfect. We're not going to find anything better. There's nothing better out there. The truth, nothing better out there. Now, there might be some things that are more fun. <clears throat> Wear your Bermuda shorts to church services next Sunday. We'll have a pool party in the backyard. That might be a lot of fun, but that's not what the Bible teaches. And people who want to go to heaven must understand this. It's simple. God spoke. He cannot lie. And my job is to believe that and keep that. And that's how my faith is made perfect through his will. Next, we talk about the love of God. And we go to 1 John in chapter 4. A lengthy scripture reading starting in verse 7. God's love is perfect. What's that mean? It never fails. 
It's always there for each one of us, and it's there to each one of us at the same capacity. There's no ups and downs. There's no different levels. 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. It was shown to us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him because he in us, and because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love of God that he has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Point number one, and there are many points and we don't have time for all of them in that lengthy reading. But love is of God. All love comes from God. Anytime man loves anything, it is because God has given him the ability to love. Now man can misdirect his love and enter the realm of sin if he chooses to. But he still knows how to love whatever that is that's wicked because God gave him that ability and man made the decision to misdirect his love. When we use the ability God has given man to love what God has told us to love, then our love, just like our faith in the prior point, becomes perfect. God is love, verse 8. God's love was manifested toward us by the giving of his only son that through him we might have life, verse 9. Because of his love, we're taught to love one another. If we love each other, God abides in us. His love has been perfected in us as a result. Verses 17 and 18 are quite significant. And that he's talking about the judgment day, the day of judgment, verse 17. And in verse 18, there's no fear in love. Because if we love God and we love each other as we've been taught to do, God's love, which is perfect, has been perfected in us. And the result is there's no fear in standing before God on judgment day. That's the fear. He's, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. How can mortals like you and me develop a perfect love when we obey God his love makes our love perfect when we love the things God teaches us to love and when we love those things the way God wants them to be loved then our love becomes perfect and that perfect love casts out the fear of the second coming in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. 
and by this we know that we are in him. So God's love has been manifested by the coming of Jesus Christ. He gave his son for a bunch of sinners because his love is perfect. Now, if you had to, uh, to give one of your children so that sinners could be saved, I, I, I mean, you've got to have a perfect love. I don't know if you could love me perfectly to the point that you give one of your children so that I might not die and lose my soul. But if you're a rare bird, oh, yeah, I love you that much, Brother Zellner. I love you that much. I'd give one of my children to save your soul. But would you give that child the way God gave Jesus? I'd let you shoot my child one time in the head with a revolver and be quick and no pain. But would you let your child go to the cross, endure the pain of that suffering, the crown of thorns, the spitting upon him, the cursing of him, the nails being driven through. Would you let your child die that way so that I could be saved? No. Why not? Because your love isn't perfect. But God's love is because he gave his child that very same way. We just had it very eloquently described to us as we partook of the Lord's Supper from Isaiah chapter 53. Who would do that? Who knows that kind of love? You people are guilty. You people are sinners. You deserve what you get. But instead, through God's love, he gave his son to die in our place. The perfect love of God. And God's word is so perfect if we, his subjects, merely keep his love, we are made perfect by that keeping according to both the love and the truth that we've already visited. That's how we do it. That's how we get mature. It's how we get complete. It's how we get ready for judgment. God cannot lie. That puts us in the commandment keeping business. And through that faith and obedience, what's next? We're perfected. We're ready for judgment. We're ready for home. If you're in the audience today and you're not ready for home, if you're afraid to stand before the judgment of Almighty God, if you're hesitant about what judgment is going to be like, may we encourage you to come to the front this morning and let's make that confession to this congregation and pray for you that you can be forgiven of all your sins and your soul can be rededicated to Jesus Christ while we stand and sing.